not what you make, it's what you keep, right? So you could have the biggest, you know, gross salary out there, but once you get done with the tax man, it might not look as hot. So if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, also your guest here on the show, or your host, I should rather say. But I'm so excited. The reason the word guest is on my mind is because of the guest that I've got today. My guest today here on the show has raised over $300 million in private money. And so just a little bit about his background. First of all, he is a private wealth advisor and he's got this huge passion for helping individuals build wealth. Now he's got a really, really interesting background. His background is running successful family establishments, specifically in the restaurant and the hospitality industry. And then he made this huge transition into finance. And that's all driven for a desire for fulfillment. And he recognized the actual gap in this industry. Now, in addition to that, one of his expertise is knowing the ins and outs of actually how 1031 exchanges work and this thing called the Delaware Statutory Trust. And so if you've never heard about, you know, particularly that second strategy, then we're going to pull the curtain back on that. He's also an expert in estate planning uh, and wealth management as well. In just a moment, you're going to meet my special guest, Mr. Frank Hanna, right after this. Well, hello, Frank, and welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So excited to have you, Frank. And first, let's talk about, since this is the Raising Private Money show, let's talk about your journey as it began with private money and talk about that a little bit, how you've gone about raising so much private money for your real estate deals and et cetera. And then we'll segue over into your uh, expertise. So one thing that I've discovered, Frank, over the years is that investors have something come along in their life that changes or triggers the trajectory of their business. And they have some kind of revelation as to, you know what? I need private money for my business. Tell us how you got involved in private money to begin with. Well, uh, as you alluded to in the intro, um, I grew up in the restaurant hospitality business um, through um, some family owned companies. And due to some of the successes we had there, we got into fixed financing or private lending um, for, you know, entrepreneurs that were looking for, you know, that that kind of private capital. And, you know, that kind of segued into our own real estate development. Um, and we were building our own portfolios of assets and different asset classes. And we had a lot of people coming to us for more traditional fixed financing. So that's kind of where the light bulb went off and said, hey, you know what? If we can do this and we have a little bit of expertise in real estate investment and management, um, how can we be a resource hub for all size investors to be able to participate in different capacities whether it's on the private lending side of things or just, you know, private equity, crowdfunding, real estate syndication. So we became kind of a, you know, a, uh, a focal point in our little market to start um, for people that were either looking for financing or wanted to participate in real estate investment, but just didn't know where to start. So that's, that's kind of how we, we got into that, that space to begin with. And then uh, we built kind of a hybrid financial planning, consulting business and, you know, kind of had that, you know, set aside right next to our private real estate investment programs. So really how you started in private money was being a private lender yourself. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We were, we 
called ourselves the Bank of Frank, and it was real, real small town and uh, low key, and people still still joke about that. But that's that's really how we started. We had local entrepreneurs and investment people that were coming to us for private private investment, and um, you know that's that's where it all began. I got you. And so then, as you said, you did that for a while. And then you started opening it up to other individuals that might want to become investors and private lenders as, as well. So how did you launch that to where you could go about and find other people that wanted to be investors and wanted to be, you know, private money lenders? Well, as I said, so when we got into like the, the first kind of phase of like our real estate, um, you know, creation, development, investment um, programs. We had a lot of people that were coming to us for that. And then on the same side of things, we had some pretty good wherewithal and some good counsel and relationships that were helping us from more of a traditional financial planning, um, you know, uh, segue. So when those two groups of people kind of came to us in two different directions, it allowed us to be kind of a matchmaker for lack of a better, better term, the people that were coming to us for more, you know, financial tax planning, trust planning, asset protection type stuff. Those people all of a sudden said, Hey, wait, wait, you guys do real estate investment as well. You know, let me see what some of those deals look like. And then we had people that were coming to us for private financing or, Hey, I've got capital. I'm looking to you know, do real estate investment. They also were able to tap into some of our, you know, more traditional financial, you know, uh, advisory services. Right. Well, you, your background is restaurants. Mine is too. I, oh, yeah. I only survived two years. That's all I could take. I, I couldn't take it. That's I still impressive. I couldn't take it anymore. Um, it, it is tough. So what was it that made you decide to leave the restaurant industry and, and move over into being a wealth advisor? I just, um, you know, I, I always say it takes a special type of person or, or somebody that's got something, you know, wrong with them to be wanting to jump into the restaurant business. And I've got all the uh, appreciation and respect in the world for people that are successful in that. But, um, you know, my father started in that started in that and knew he wanted to do that since he was 12 years old is what he told, told me. And I just didn't have the passion that he did. At one point in time, we had 15 different restaurants. I was managing three restaurants. I did that for 15 years. And at the end of the day, I, I realized I was never going to be as successful as he was in it. And I just wasn't passionate about it. And I ended up um, not enjoying life and kind of resenting the fact that I felt like I was stuck. So Again, along the way, I had picked up a couple tools as it related to, you know, financial planning, tax planning, real estate investment. And I had a lot of good relationships. And I said, look, I think I could be a, you know, a really good resource hub for the fast moving entrepreneur to be able to, you know, not be jack of all trades, master of none. But, hey, you know, if you have a, a question or need a resource or need a solution, um, if I can't help you directly, I know what direction to point you in. What you just said reminds me of a word that I have come to learn is really foundational when it comes to raising funds, uh, being a connector, et cetera. And that's networking. And Absolutely. so when you started branching out away from the restaurant industry and the restaurant business, how, how did you start? Um, either communicating with your network about opportunities to invest in, or how did you, if you needed to, how did you end up starting to grow your network? So I, in the beginning, I raced out to anybody that would listen and said, Hey, look, you know, this is what I'm doing now. I've reinvented myself and, you know, I'm motivated and determined to kind of build this. And in the first few years, a lot of the people I was you know, speaking with were, were uh, skeptical, you know, so they wanted to see us kind of build something, you know, get some financial scale, have some successes and make sure that we could stay in this business and sustain long-term success before they were willing to, you know, really give us a shot or, you know, invest with confidence. 
So, you know, we went out there and again, and I still do this to this, this day, I just mark it 24 seven. I talk to anybody that'll listen, you know, we've got many different tools in our toolbox. And I, and I say this to everybody that I talk to, and I'm hundred percent confident when I say this, you know, if you give us the opportunity to meet with you, understand what you're working on, what's important to you, what your goals and objectives are, there's a hundred percent chance that I'm going to be able to show you an idea that's going to either create value, make you money, save you money. There's going to be something that I can show you or introduce you to that's going to, you know, put you in a better place than before we met. So I just run around constantly. I learn along the way and we've built really good relationships that have improved over improved over time. So whatever it is you're looking for, if it's, you know, on the real estate side of things, I know who the major players are across the country who've got the longest standing track record, um, best success, you know, strongest financial scale. And we've worked out deals to, you know, be able to partner with them to bring some of those sophisticated opportunities down, you know, from the, the larger investor down to the, to, you know, the quote unquote smaller investor. Right. How would you describe your ideal client that you work with and that you're looking for? I always say we look for quality versus quantity. You know, oftentimes the the more complex the the situation or the more assets um, that are there, we can potentially make a bigger impact. But I just look for quality individuals that are easy to work with, who have like minded um, goals like I do. And whether you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year or a hundred million a year, there's going to be something that we can show you. That's going to, um, again, improve where you are currently. And due to the, you know, heavy duty due diligence that we've done over the years and the time and energy we put into kind of vetting the marketplace, so to speak, we've, we've kind of taken on that risk to, put our best foot forward to give those smaller investors access to different things that we're working on. So we don't discriminate, um, you know, on size. So I'll talk to anybody that's out there that is in a position to, um, to you know, to potentially invest. I'd say most of our deals have thresholds of, you know, I, I, there's some, there's some, uh, discrepancy with this, but I'd say most of our deals have minimums as, as low as $50,000. Right, right. Well, and when I'm um, teaching my new private lenders, private investors to invest in our deals, that's my minimum as well. Yeah, fifty thousand. I mean, you know, it's it costs me the same to get the deal closed with the attorney, whether it's fifty thousand or five million. You know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you try, you know, you try to do, and we we spend a lot of time on this, and I'm sure you did too. You know, you want to really be able to pass pass that value on to the investor, but you can't compromise, you know, all your, all your costs and, and everything there. So you got to make it work for you as well as the investor. But um, I think when it's all said and done, um, that's a, a relatively low threshold to get access to some sophisticated deals. You know, some of the big players that are out there don't want to talk to you unless you've got, you know, five, $10 million. That's right. That's right. Um, just in case, any of our listeners or audience uh, need to jump off early and can't stay to the end of the show. Yep. Frank, go ahead and give out uh, the best way for them to contact you or uh, your website and learn more about uh, the investment opportunities uh, that you have. Sure. So my email is Frank Hanna spelled F R A N K H A N N A at R E V is in Victor X is an X-ray wealth.com. And uh, the, the URL of the w website is the same, revxwealth.com. Shoot us an email. We have sample deals that are on there. It's, it's a very, um, you know, small uh, portion of our overall deals, but you can kind of get a flavor for some of the things that we're working on and happy to set up a call, respond to an email. We have all types of different deals that have different tax advantages, shapes, sizes, different things that you're looking for. So again, confident um, there'd be something we could um, introduce you to, even if the timing's not perfect. Sure. And we'll have uh, that email address and the website as well 
um, in the show notes. And we'll also get that again out at the end of the show. So one area that you and your team are really, really good at, Frank, is uh, tax management, you know, mitigating taxes, saving taxes. So what are some common myths? What are some common, let well, say, misconceptions about tax management? And, you know, how can people navigate them effectively? I think there's all different opportunities that are out there. And I think what scares people is, is kind of allocating too many dollars towards different real estate opportunities or even retirement plans where they can't necessarily touch that money tomorrow. So what I see is people just getting so caught up in, in what their perceived liquidity needs are or their you know rainy day fund is that they, they end up keeping too much capital in those buckets and then they missed opportunities and they end up paying Uncle Sam a lot more than they could or should. Um, so it's really, again, about education and really walking through somebody's you know goals, objectives, all the things that they have going on to really determine, all right, how much above and beyond, what are your absolute um, you know, needs throughout your, your family and your life? What else is left? And then what can we do to kind of nudge you in a positive way to kind of get those dollars allocated to mitigate some of those taxes and then use those dollars to continue to, to grow for you, produce passive income. Um, and I do it myself, you know, that when I first got into this, I had a comfort zone and a comfort zone and I had to really push myself and say, okay, what are you willing to save each month towards these goals? And, you know, that, that dollar amount is transformed over the years. Um, but there's a lot of things I've been able to do. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not kind of drawn that line in the sand and said, Hey, this is, this is something I should pursue, but it's all about education, having the right advisors or, you know, mentors that can kind of guide you through that. For sure. That makes a lot of sense. You know, <laughs> We're in a very, very interesting market, aren't we? Stock markets all over the place, you know, yep. for some time. Uh, interest rates. I mean, we've never seen what the Fed has done recently in history as far as, um, you know, the raising of rates. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I got some good friends that do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I know where we're going to see interest rates going over the next 12 months. But, you know, people in general, have a concern about particularly what kind of decisions they should make, what kind of smart investment decisions they should make in a rapidly changing economy like we're in, and mm -hmm. what's the way for people to stay informed and to really know what's the truth about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think that, you know, whether it's the Fed doing kind of the unprecedented over the last few years or, you know, just tax law in general, general, um, you know, you can never, you know, the, the target is constantly moving. Right. So, you know, I, we, we joke and say people get analysis paralysis, right? So you're always waiting for the perfect time. It's going to give you the perfect game plan that you can, uh, you know, run with for, for the next, you know, several years at least, and you just never know, right? So you have to plan within the guidelines of the tax law and what interest rates look like. And again, diversification is king. And, um, you know, again, I, 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 I feel optimis optimistic about some of the things that could happen here in 24, but, you know, you never know until you know. Um, but that's where I think, you know, planning for, you know, the proper you know, are planning with the proper tax laws that are in place right now are, are critical. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that could go in a variety of different directions, depending on, you know, who's in the next administration. So that's why I say, hey, plan for today, swing the bat today, because uh, that bat might be taken out of your hands in a year or two. That's for sure. So, you know, speaking of crystal balls, uh, Frank, is there any kind of like new economic trend or new opportunity that you've noticed, you know, uh, that's coming along uh, that you've, you know, shared with your clients that you have now to help them succeed with what they've got going on? 
Yeah, I, you know, I uh, I keep talking about taxes because uh, they get me excited. <clears throat> no, I'm just kidding. But um, I <laughs> hey, think the taxes got me excited when Uncle Sam told me that actually my CPA told me the check that I had to write uh, back in October. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, seriously. <clears throat> you know, one of my things my dad taught me early on is uh, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Right. So you could have the biggest, you know, gross salary out there. But once you get done with the tax man, it might not look as hot. So, you know, we, again, are always focused on on tax planning. And that's kind of, you know, not only on the real estate side of things, but also like our financial planning side of things. So, you know, one of the one of the things that's changing that, you know, pertains, I think, to real estate investors is, you know, bonus depreciation or, uh, you know, accelerated depre depreciation, whatever, whatever you want to call it you know, as part of Trump's Tax and Jobs Act of 2017, um, we were able to get 100% bonus or accelerated depreciation. So when you invest in certain types of assets, you could take that depreciation schedule that's typically drawn out, you know, from 20 to, you know, 39 years and take those tax breaks or the depreciation over time. But for certain types of assets in certain segments, um, you're able to push all that, you know, depreciation fast forward and get a substantial tax deduction in year one or the first few years. So we do a lot of deals like that. So for so so for real estate investors that have active income, they can participate in those type of deals or um, individuals that just have a substantial amount of passive income. Those can be very impactful. And last year was the last year of 100% bonus depreciation. We just wrapped up a deal um, for 80% bonus depreciation. Next year, it's supposed to go to 60 to 40 to 20 and then zero. Um, so those opportunities are going away unless Congress votes on extending that, changing that, but they can't seem to agree on anything. So again, rather than guesstimate or save my dollars to cross my fingers and hope things are going to get better in a few years. I'm rolling with what I know is accurate right now. Um, so we just raised a substantial amount of money for those type of investors here in the latter part of 2023. We're going to do another program um, in the fall of 2024. Um, there's opportunities there. And then, um, you know, I, I would say, um, on the 1031 exchange planning type of thing that's been around forever. So most people are aware of that, but there's some, you know, there's some different planning solutions um, that go along there that, that some people are taking advantage of. That's wonderful. Well, I tell you what, what an amazing resource, Frank, that you are, um, you know, for your, for your clients. Um, I think one of your main asset classes, uh, is it still the multifamily uh, self-storage and hotels? Yeah. So we, you know, we, we invest in, in most asset classes. I'd say the only thing we're not really participating in is, is office. So, you know, we do multifamily, self-storage, student housing, uh, hospitality, you know, mostly hotels, um, industrial. So at any given time, you know, sometimes we'll lean one way or another, depending on what's going on, but we still do. Um, have, you know, I'd say really attractive deals in all those asset classes. Gotcha. Well, Frank, one more time, uh, please give out uh, your website, your email, best way for folks to contact you and continue the conversation as to how you can make an impact in their financial future. Sure. So my uh, email is Frank, F-R-A-N-K, Hannah, H-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at R-E-V-X-Wealth.com. And URL is revxwealth.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. If you go on our website, there's a lot of good informational material there. There's sample deals that we have access to currently that could give you a flavor. Um, but by no means is that even close to the, the total amount of deals that we have um, going at any even given time. So feel free to reach out at any point. That's fantastic. Frank, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right, you got it. There you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm your host, and I want to thank you for taking time to join out with us. If you happen to be listening on iTunes, be sure and follow me, Spotify, any of your other 
popular platforms. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes as well. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money.